Good evening. Hey. <sighs> Good evening, everyone, and welcome back to the Frank Ratchie Studio for Creative Inquiry, the research laboratory of the College of Fine Arts here at Carnegie Mellon University, dedicated to the support of atypical, anti-disciplinary, and inter-institutional research and outreach at the intersection of art, science, technology, and culture. Uh, I'm Golan Levin, uh, Professor of Art and Director of the Studio, and it's um, it's my pleasure tonight to welcome you to another episode in our Steiner Lecture Series in Creative Inquiry. Um, before uh, we get to tonight's speaker, I wanted to kind of alert you to two um, very uh, belatedly uh, organized but really amazing lectures that are happening soon. And I want to make sure that you are apprised of them. The first is that on November 6th, which is voting day, you should vote first and then make sure you get over to, to see Team Lab uh, presenting. Um, Japanese ultra technologists from Tokyo, they do uh, extraordinary, uh, you know, like 400 synchronized projector kind of, uh, you know, you know, large scale, gigantic scale uh, interactive installations, very beautiful work and uh, in, at the highest end of of uh, what's technologically possible. So they're coming here from Tokyo and they're really uh, an exciting group. So don't miss Team Lab. That's going to be at 6.30 on Tuesday, November 6th, which is later than our normal start time of five. So please make a note. 6.30 is Team Lab. And then on Monday, November 12th, it will be our pleasure to host um, tactical and hactical media artist Addie Wagenknecht. Um, she is an amazing artist who does a lot of interesting stuff with robotics and drones and paint on canvas and uh, just a really, really smart artist who I can't wait to introduce to you if you're not familiar, already familiar with her work. Uh, she was here um, a number of years ago at this point in a residency to start Deep Lab, which was a cyber feminist uh, congress dedicated to the examination of issues related to cybersecurity and so forth. Okay, so uh, without further ado, it's my pleasure to introduce Scott Weingart, who is the director of Carnegie Mellon's Digital Humanities Program, uh, or called D Sharp. Um, Scott is going to introduce uh, tonight's speaker. Uh, Scott, where'd you go? There you are. Uh, thank you, Golan, um, and thank you to the Studio for Creative Inquiry for co-sponsoring this event, as well as uh, the D Sharp Center uh, that he just mentioned, as well as the Department of English at Carnegie Mellon University. Uh, we have come together to uh, uh, bring Robin Sloan, who we are all delighted is here this evening. Uh, I don't know uh, how many details Robin remembers, but I emailed him in 2012 after he published Mr. Penumbra's 24-hour bookstore. And I said, this is amazing. This is digital humanities. I would love to interview. And he said, yes. He said, I'd, an interview would be great. So, you know, we sat on this for a little while and uh, then he became victim to his own success uh, because he wound up doing, I don't know, book tours and this and that and the other thing and we never wound up, uh, it didn't work out. And so I'm considering this a, a six year later return on the promise that Robin made. Uh, Robin comes to us from the Bay Area. Uh, he is a New York Times bestseller for the book, uh, the aforementioned book, Mr. Penumbra's 24 Hour Bookstore, as well as the recent uh, book, Sourdough, which is in paperback now or soon, now, great. Um, uh, Penumbra has been considered a uh, love letter to the digital humanities, uh, one of the many reasons we are happy to have him here today. Uh, and the reason why we have him here today, as opposed to a month ago or a while ago, is because we needed to wait for olive season to, to complete. Uh, because among the many other fantastic things he does, he produces and sells olive oil with his partner in the Bay Area. Uh, he has been called a media inventor. Uh, a, te a technologist, uh, a fantastic author. Um, he also is the writer of a wonderful newsletter that you can find on his website, robinsloan.com, highly recommended. Uh, and he has been here for the last week doing a lot of wonderful events at CMU, including a workshop over the last three days that he'll talk to us about, uh, as well as uh, class visits and a bunch of other events. Uh, and we are all delighted to see uh, what he has to say. So. Introducing Robin Sloan. Thank you very much. Thank you, Golan, and thank you, Scott. Thank you all for coming out. This is such a terrific crowd in a space that, I mean, I've only been here for about a week, as Scott said, but I've grown to really appreciate and feel comfortable here in the studio for Creative Inquiry. So thank you for um, creating a space like this, and thank you for sharing it with me tonight. So um, 
I'm a writer. I've written these two novels. Um, the only other piece of background you need to know to understand anything that's going to come next is that um, my whole life from sort of conscious memory onward has been about loving books and loving computers and reading books and using computers and never thinking or feeling that there was any contradiction between those two things. Always feeling like they went very comfortably together. So that's me. At, uh, at Harvard University in 1985, the Italian writer Italo Calvino, one of the greats of the 20th century, was supposed to give a series of lectures, but he died actually before he was able to deliver them. But the text, his sort of notes toward those lectures has now become a very famous book. It's called Six Memos for the Next Millennium. That's the cover of the first edition, by far the best cover. So at Carnegie Mellon University in 2018, Robin Sloan was supposed to give a short talk and he did give the talk. <laughs> And that talk is titled Six Memos for the Next Five Minutes. Now, Calvino, this is so Calvino, um, his six memos for the next millennium were actually just five with the sixth forever sort of an unfinished gesture, just a ghost, which is amazing. Uh, and that means that I only have to do five as well. So here they are. Here's how we're going to spend the next 40 minutes or so. And with each of these in the spirit of a memo, you know, an inter-office memorandum, I'm going to tell you what I think that you should do. These are assignments. And you, of course, can decide whether or not you want to accept them. So they are generation, invention, development, pleasure, and email. And we'll start with generation. And we're going to start that with a live demo. So... What we were doing in this very space for the last three days as we were writing, there's a group of us, about 12, 14, people kind of came and went with a core group holding it steady night after night. And we were writing a story. The objective was to write something short, um, a, a false history of a fictional art movement from the 20th century. And we weren't writing it alone. We we're actually working with something called a recurrent neural network that had constructed a model of this big corpus of text that I had given it. And the subject of all this text was art history. So this model had some opinions about the world. It thought that people did things like make paintings and create sculptures and get in fights with other artists and die in interesting ways. So the way this started is we all sat down um, and we essentially... Um, began thoughts. You know, we would say something like, the artist began. And let's say our imagination gives out at that moment. We're like, the artist began what? Wait, what am I even talking about? You know, what kind of artist is this? So we'd press the tab key, and this network would give us recommendations. Began to produce three works, boring. His education, maybe to produce a collection of poems. Okay, I can work with that. So we say, accepted. And what you notice, and this is important, is now the text just fades into mine. It doesn't keep some watermark, some sort of radioactive dye that says this was written by a machine. Now there's no difference between what I contributed and what the machine contributed. So then we keep going. We say these poems were mostly about Australian art, maybe. Creative poets, mm, a little self-referential. Britain, boring. Interpreting the ancient Serbian. Okay, we can work with that. <laughs> and here, here I'm going to say, you know, this network has obviously done something interesting, but it's, it gets a little confused as the text goes on. And so I'm going to actually do my own thing here. I'm going to say, I like Serbian. I like communists. The ancient Serbian communist communities. And right off the bat, we have something interesting, something provocative, something evocative that I wouldn't have come up with on my own. Now, what's important is that we didn't stop there. We didn't just generate a bunch of these and kind of print them out and say, look, generative text. We put them into drafts, we put them into files, and we started to manipulate them. We decided what we liked and what we didn't like. We used our own sort of aesthetic judgments. We kind of followed our own noses. We moved things around. We used the things we like. We pasted them back into this augmented editor to make even more text. And so what we ended up with was this amazing hybrid. What we ended up with was a story, a false history. 
So I want to read you a tiny bit of that. Territoria migraine, it's migraine. <laughs> Fetishized transparency, things like air, the sea, time, and the intentions of short stories. She meditated nightly in front of a saltwater aquarium. She continued her correspondence with Jan Hirsch, the self-styled bad boy of lithography. <laughs> Lately spurning blocks of traditional size, Hirsch had begun to use titanic blocks. He termed them his ancient children, labored over by teams of assistants. And his letters clearly touched Migraine. She embraced the medium with a frenzy. In the summer of 1970, she penned her only known manifesto. For Jan. Lithography is defined by the power of the L. The L is one of the most expressive goals of the artist. The L is a ship coming to the rescue. The L is the necessary question, the sole systematic medium for the exploration of life. Lithography relies on invisible forces. We are moving together. The freak and the dancer make a pattern in the fire. So you can read the whole false history here, um, a URL. It's live now. One of our goals for the workshop was to write it in three days and not, you know, uh, resolve to edit it and uh, publish it six months later, but to do so immediately. And I just want to underscore, there's kind of a philosophy, um, an argument really built into that whole process I just described and the text that you just saw. In what I just read, you can't tell what came from the computer and what came from us. And in fact, that distinction isn't really meaningful because the text bounced back and forth between this neural network and this room full of writers so many times. Our overriding goal, you know, we had many sort of subsidiary goals. One was just to experiment with some new tools. One was to convene an interesting group from the Pittsburgh community. But the overriding goal was to make something that people would actually read. And I don't just mean read a description of the process. I mean, I think we're probably familiar with that rhythm. I certainly experience that a lot myself. I see some project, I see the headline, it sounds interesting. I click through, I read kind of like what they did. I go, ha ha, that's cool. And then I close the tab. And I don't think, especially when it comes to text, you know, there's different ways to engage with different kinds of work, different kinds of art. When it comes to text, I don't think that's actually reading. So we made something. I hope you like to read it. There's, um, <laughs> there's some ideas about art and the lives of artists embedded into it. And there's also an argument about maybe how we should think about generative text and this process that's going to become more and more common of collaborating with machines and machine learning models to produce things like fiction and art. OK. The next memo is about invention. Many years ago, I put this term on my website. It's right there on the front, on the front page, next to writer, which comes first, because that's what pays my bills. There's this term media inventor. And it was the result of a, of a very genuine struggle um, that I'd had and been kind of grappling with for a long time about how to describe what I do or what I really like to do, you know, what kind of makes, what kind of work makes me happiest, what I find myself preoccupied with when I'm not writing traditional novels. So this is what happened. And um, I think when everybody is using your term in like really scary quote marks, it means you've either made a terrible mistake or you're sort of onto something, but people aren't sure yet. So I'm on a mission. This, this has been happening for a while. Um, I'm still on a mission to get it out of the quotation marks. And truly, I think if I'm ever going to speak in a room of actual and or potential media inventors, this is that room. So I'm going to grab onto this opportunity and make the strongest case I can. I want to do that by anchoring the idea. I want to try to convince you that this is a real thing. So has anyone in this room actually ever heard of or been to the Grolier Club in New York? OK, the, the scholar of uh, early printing says, yes, definitely. Uh, the Grolier Club in New York is a really amazing library. It is a place, um, it's been around for a long time, it's named for a famous collector of very old, very rare books, and they have maintained and expanded that collection. You go inside and it is like something out of a dream of sort of 
bibliophile Harry Potter. It's all dark, burnished wood. All of the dimmers and all the lights have clearly been sort of set so they can't go above a sort of 20% murk. It's awesome. It's fantastic. This is me inside the Grolier Club. They have an actual secret passage in the bookshelves, which is required. And I had a special opportunity because my first novel, Mr. Penumbra's 24-Hour Bookstore, um, no spoilers, but the plot sort of intersects with the life of the real historical figure, Aldous Minutius, who was one of the first great printers of books. This is around the year 1500. To this day, he's still one of like the great printers and publishers of all time. And as it happens, the Grolier Club has a big collection of books published by his press. They're called the Aldeans. They are very old and very rare and very valuable. And the Grolier Club's got them. So uh, at the time, actually, there was a big kind of all this minutious anniversary coming up. They were getting ready for show, and they invited me in to kind of see these Aldeans up close and personal. And what I saw, even though I had read a lot about this publisher and read a lot about these books, what I saw surprised me. Uh, the club's sort of main curator and librarian led me over to a table where they had been set up. And there were several books that um, looked the way I expected them to look. They were just kind of big and, you know, massive and impressive, and they looked very old and very serious. But there were some, that's his sigil, the dolphin and the anchor. It means festina lente, which is make haste, but slowly, which is nice. Some of the books on the table were small. Um, they were even smaller than sort of modern paperbacks. They were teeny tiny, these little objects. And I really hadn't expected that. I expressed my surprise to the curator and the librarian. She said, oh, yeah, that was the thing. That was Aldous Minutius's one of his great innovations. Um, they decided that in order to make these newly published classics, I mean, we're talking about like Aristotle and all these great Greek poets, in order to make them more accessible, and by accessible it meant both more portable and cheaper, because, of course, at that time paper and ink were like, quite pricey. So to use less of them was a pretty smart move. They decided to shrink them down. And so she went on. Uh, this was probably made them more affordable, more accessible to more people than ever before. And she said this like very casually, even though she was about to blow my mind. She said, yeah, I mean, this book, uh, this is probably the first time anybody in history had the chance to curl up with Aristotle. So curling up with a book, as anyone who has ever curled up with a book knows, is like the most basic, foundational, familiar, comfortable thing. We think of this, especially these days, as we compare physical books to other things, e-books or reading on screens, we think of this as one of its like essential qualities. You know, it's what we love, that they're so human and they kind of fit our bodies and we can take them under the bed sheets and turn on a flashlight, all that stuff. And here was this reminder that there was a moment when that was new. And this, of course, is where my fiction writer's brain kind of spins into overdrive and blasts it out into unreality. I imagine it being advertised in the streets of Venice, like big wheat paper posters going up, you know, beside the canals, like, uh, uh, just published uh, Aristotle's Nicomachean Ethics, now featuring curl-up technology. <laughs> And like people waiting in line for the for the Aldous store, you know, there's like the long line before they release the new model, and um, they're murmuring to one another, "Have you tried the new one with with the curl up?" No, no, not yet. How is that? I don't know. I'm going to try it out, see what I think. Which is ridiculous and fanciful, but also sort of real. So there was more. Not only were some of the books tiny and comfortable for the first time in human history, some of them looked like this on the inside whole books printed in italics. Um, they were hard to read, not only because they were in Latin and Greek, but also because it just, it's sort of strange to look at. It seems to sort of buzz on the page. But this, as some of you might know, this is actually how a lot of these books from that time were published. The whole text block, page after page, kind of slanty and slopey like that. Here's the reason. Aldous Minutius was very successful. He was selling these small books, these the first time that some of these um, great works of the sort of classic philosophers and poets had been available to more or less normal people, people who could read Latin or Greek, so not normal people, <laughs> more people. Um, but a lot of people found them, if you can believe it, they found that sort of old style type too mechanical, too robotic and off-putting. 
because, of course, they had learned to read books written by scribes, and they preferred the hand of the scribe. So all this minutia says to his in-house typographer, um, this man who actually cut forms out of metal that then became the, the type that they used to print the books, whose name was Francesco Griffo. Minutius asked Griffo to come up with a new typeface that was a simulation of the hand of the scribe. They wanted to essentially use a special effect. They wanted to play a trick on the readers. So Griffo goes away, he hammers on some metal, he comes back, and they start printing books like this, and they're a huge hit. I mean, it's like commercial bonanza, so much so that other people start copying it. And so first it was called, well, first it was known as Aldous Minutius' type, but then as it spread around Venice and beyond, it became known as the Italic type, and then the Italics, then of course over time it just becomes Italics. And so to me this represents the stakes for media invention. This almost defines the scale of what's possible. Italics. Italics are in every machine produced by people today. They're on every screen. They're in every book, on every printed thing. They are utterly ubiquitous and, by the way, beautiful. It's like this constant thread of grace and beauty running through all the things that surround us in our visual culture. And they came from a particular place at a particular time. I mean, we know the people who had this idea and the people who made it, and it spread out from there. And I think it would be pretty exciting to make something that eventually had that kind of impact and that kind of ubiquity, an invention, immediate invention of that scale. So think about that next time you see words go like this. Think about Griffo and about media invention. Okay, so now I want to talk about development. I had an early Kindle, um, one of the first generations of Kindles, and I really, really liked it. I think I liked it more than most people liked theirs, and it was because of that e-ink screen. I don't know if you folks have seen these or used e-ink in different sort of guises. Something about it, it's kind of matte non-reflectivity, the fact that it could load up these new blocks of text, but it really didn't look digital. I found it just totally, totally compelling. And it actually kind of conjured a strange to me feeling. It made me want to put my own words on that screen in a way that at that time the web really wasn't doing, certainly kind of digital devices weren't doing. But I saw that e-ink screen, I just went like, I want to write something that's on that screen. So amazingly at that time I could. The Kindle store had just opened itself up to self-publishing. So anyone who had a chunk of text they were willing to format in a few simple ways, could put it up for sale. You had to design a bad little cover and give it a price. The minimum was 99 cents, so my price was 99 cents. And I started to sell these short stories in the Kindle store. And I had my wish. I got to see them on that Kindle screen. And that process is very familiar to us now. Like We know, yes, you can publish things on the internet and in app stores and on the Kindle store, and you can upload your music to SoundCloud and even to Spotify. Big deal. Well, actually, it is a big deal. And I think it's worth remembering that it's a big deal and thinking hard about what it implies for a person's career, an artistic career or a creative career. This is my theory. This is my sort of mental model for publication of all kinds. I think for a long time, publication looked like this. Um, <laughs> there was the broad lowlands of people who were trying to get better at something like writing and they were drafting things and they were practicing. They were sharing it with their peers and their teachers. And then there are the people who are getting paid to do it. They're up at the top of the mountain. And between those two groups, there was this steep slope. And that slope was the gatekeepers. And I'm not someone who thinks that all gatekeepers are bad or even that most gatekeepers are bad. But several decades ago, it was only gatekeepers. You know, if you wanted a book, something you had written to be widely available to like a lot of people, you had to go through these channels. You had to eventually flow through an agency somewhere and your manuscript had to land on an editor's desk. It's very steep. If you imagine this as sort of the graph of your writing life, say, there's one axis, um, and it's your effort. It's all the really hard, diligent work you're putting into becoming a better writer. You can substitute other disciplines there. And then the other axis is the reward. It's what you're getting back. And it's not just financial. In fact, I don't think it's primarily financial. It's 
the feeling of progress. Um, it's having a sense of an audience somewhere, um, of connecting with someone who gets what you're trying to do. It's winning a prize, it's getting a good review, um, it's seeing somebody tweet a link to something that you've made, right? All the ways that you can be kind of rewarded and get your batteries charged back up. So in that old regime, I think most careers look like this. Along that axis of effort, you work and 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 then your moment. Your manuscript lands on the right desk, you get published, and I'm not saying you become Stephen King or J.K. Rowling overnight, but you have a career and that's a big leap. And from that point onward, you know, unless you do something horribly wrong or decide to kind of bail out, you have a career if you want it. And that's fine, except that that, of course, is not the only story. A lot of people's careers went like this. You work and you work and you work and you work. And you work and you work and you work. And you work and you work and you give up. Maybe you send in a manuscript and it does land on the editor's desk and the editor like had a bad roast beef sandwich that day and it just goes in the trash can. Anytime I think about that too hard, about the things that have been lost because of bad roast beef sandwiches and because of this system, it makes me really sad. I wouldn't have made it. I think I would have worked and worked and worked I wouldn't, even done, I wouldn't even have done the second round. I would, would have just given up there. The truth is, I'm a weenie. Um, but that was then, and this is what's available now. This is so much better. Now, you can work and work and get a little reward. You can publish something in the Kindle store for 99 cents, and 100 people download it. Score. Then you can work a little more. And this is what I did. You can decide that you're good enough to write something like a novella, right? Not a whole novel yet, but something short. And you can put it into the world as a Kickstarter project. And maybe 600 people will sign up for your Kickstarter project. So you work and you work and you write that novella and you get a little bit more reward. And in that way, you move through the world, kind of taking one step at a time. And at each step, you're actually getting something back. You're getting a little more fuel to keep going. And I think that's awesome for a whole bunch of reasons. It means us, the weenies, have a chance. It means bad roast beef sandwiches can't stop work from getting into the world. And also, this is unimportant, I think, often overlooked. It means you can like find a comfortable step and you can just stay there. You don't have to be aiming for the top of that plateau. You can say, three steps in, I write extremely niche fiction about a squad of vampire firefighters. I have a, re <laughs> have a regular community of 2,300 readers. I'm good. <laughs> That wasn't available before. You couldn't make that work, but you can now. And I think that's really, really remarkable. So um, that's all to say that, of course, whatever works for a person's development in their career is great. But boy, based on my experience, I strongly, strongly recommend this structure and this path um, for the health of your heart um, and for the sake of kind of finding out what's available at all those different steps instead of just remaining fixed with your eyes on the, uh, on the mountaintop. So please take the stairs. OK. Now I want to talk about pleasure. I guess I want to make a plea for pleasure as kind of a good unto itself. There's a lot of ways that work can be good. You know, it can be smart. It can be inventive. And obviously, I like inventive. It can be gorgeous. It can be accomplished. And it can be all of those things without producing much pleasure. And I think sometimes, often, pleasure is associated with like the lowbrow, the mainstream. It feels like you're kind of trading in raw meat. Oh, it's too easy. It's kitschy. It's schmaltzy. It's sentimental. Um, the people who say that have never tried to make something that brings people pleasure. Pleasure is not easy. It's very hard. And we live in this weird, intense time. I don't need to tell you that. There's a lot of sad, bad, scary, stressful, and dangerous things happening out there. And I think it's particularly at times like this that people who maybe 
have the impulse towards pleasure really question themselves. Like, am I wasting everyone's time? Is this something that's even appropriate for me to be doing? Shouldn't I be talking about serious things, heavy things, angsty things? Shouldn't I be writing stories about broken people living through tragic circumstances? Shouldn't I, in fact, be adapting that into a series for Netflix? I wonder that a lot, or I used to wonder that more. You know, I was, you always want to be the smart one, the inventive one, the accomplished one. And so, of course, you wonder, like, am I doing the right thing? Is this, like, what I should be aiming for? Um, I'm here to report to you with the relatively limited perspective of having published books for at least a few years and having had the opportunity, the luxury of getting feedback back from the world, um, that producing pleasure is the best. You get emails like this. My library always has a display of books with a theme, rather in the shape of a wedding cake. With no explanation, the other day, all the covers were yellow. And there was your enchanting book waiting for me. I have a vivid memory of the day 76 years ago when I looked at a page in my Dick and Jane book and realized I could read. Reading has been one of the most important things in my life. Most of what I read, have read has, as you said, faded in my mind, but I cannot believe this book with its charming story and loving characters will fade away. You have warmed my heart. And you know an email is meaningful when you immediately forward it to your parents, <laughs> which you can see I did there. So again, I just want to say that, you know, I'm not just sort of, uh, listen to me, I know what's going on here, I know what's really valuable in the world. I'm sharing this because I struggled with it. Like, I really, really struggled with it for a long time. I used to wonder and worry about what all the work was for, you know, if I had a shot at doing something for the ages, something that would be remembered. But for me, this settles it. Uh, I think the delivery of pleasure, warmth, and comfort is available to everyone, you know, in any undertaking, no matter what you're producing. And I think you just have to care about it. For my fifth and final memo, I'm going to end where all great arguments end with email. And um, this one's very simple, actually. Uh, if you walk away with nothing else, please um, walk away with this action item. I want to tell you something very, very important. And that is, email is the way that you, if you are a scholar, an artist, someone who wants to be a scholar, someone who wants to be an artist, uh, email is the way that you are going to keep in touch with the people who care about what you're doing, period. It's not Twitter, it's not Facebook, it's not Instagram, it's not the networks that are going to rise up and replace those things. Um, email is low tech, it's kind of funky, it's definitely long in the tooth, and that's the point. That's exactly why it's so powerful and so reliable. Um, the reason I put up this extremely disturbing picture of the San Francisco earthquake and fire from 1906 is that um, I have long understood that my email list if my sort of digital house, my whole digital city was burning down and I was totally in a hurry and there's only one thing I could save, there's no question, it would be my email list. I would let it all burn, the Twitter followers, the Instagram account, my whole personal website with all my writing, God, all my stuff that I've posted there, my blog entries, I would save the email list because the only way I can tell anyone about the new website, the fresh one, <laughs> is if I have that email list. I started it almost 10 years ago. Some of the people on that email list signed up, I don't know why, just after I first started posting those short stories in the Kindle store. And slowly, I do mean slowly, people have joined ever since. And now it's kind of a lot of people. And these aren't just randos on the social networks. They're people who really care. They're people who have been following along and at this point feel invested in everything that I'm producing. It's magical. The thing is, email lists grow really slow. You have the opportunity on social networks because they're designed this way to suddenly explode. You know, maybe you have something you release into the world, some paper, some idea, an essay, a work of art, and it goes boom. And suddenly you have like 10,000 new followers overnight. I mean, I think we all understand at this point that the followers are so, so contingent. Having 10,000 followers only anywhere only means that at some point that platform has the opportunity to tell you, 
we think you should pay us to reach those 10,000 followers. And you're mixed in there with everything else. Email's different. There is no viral explosion in email. Email lists grow slow. But often, things that grow slow also grow strong. They're like real gnarly and resilient. So if you were to start an email list tonight, which you should, you will probably get one person signing up every month for the next year. But let's say you're putting out some new work, you know, you're talking about whatever it is you're most interested in. The year after that, it'll accelerate and it'll be about maybe one person a week or one person a fortnight. And then you'll really get going. Your career will have begun. You'll have stuff out there in the world like books, articles, papers, art, research, whatever. It's going to be bringing more people in. They'll be like, yes, I do want to follow along with this brilliant person's output. They'll start signing up and you will reach the speed of subscriptions that I, as a best-selling New York Times, <laughs> New York Times best-selling author have reached, which is approximately two to three people every week. So you can do the math. It grows slow. And so the only solution to that is to start immediately and begin to build that as I tell you, I just, I'm going to sound like such a kind of bug-eyed evangelist about this, um, but this is the kind of thing that can be such an asset to your career and your life and your output and, and your heart and everything else to know that you've got this posse that's been with you for 10 years. So you better start it now. Okay, that's five memos and... There it is, still in scare quotes, media inventor. I, uh, I'm not worried because everything starts out in square, scare quotes, doesn't it? Movie was for a long time in scare quotes. Paperback, briefly in scare quotes. It was new and weird. I think when you see the scary quotation marks, you know that things are still malleable. And that's the best place to play and work and participate in the sort of solidification and standardization of that thing. It's when the quotation marks drop away. It's a representation of all the work that went into that moment. That's designers and publishers and writers and marketers and the people who picked up the boxes and put them into trucks that took them to railway stations. It's people doing things, people taking action, people just like us in places just like this. I find that prospect totally exciting, um, and I hope you do too. I hope there's at least a few prospective media inventors in the room. With that, I will say thanks for your time.